homosexuals in the 1960s and 70s were mistreated, discriminated against, and even hated by much of the United States population, given that many psychiatrists still considered homosexuality a mental illness until 1973. Seeking public acceptance, they were seen as radicals. They compared their movement of seemingly radical social ideals to the civil rights movement because of their similar natures and common struggles. American homosexuals, both male and female, protested, striked, fought, and even rioted to be treated properly and accepted by everyone. Naming their fight for rights the homophile movement, they had thousands of followers and over 50 organizations related to the movement by 1969. Have until the second. Okay, have until partway through there. Greenwich Village is an area in New York City known to have a mostly gay population and to be overall gay friendly. It contains the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookstore, the first gay bookstore in the U.S., as well as many gay bars such as the mafia-owned Stonewall Inn. Police raids were an unfortunate common practice in the area during this time because of their intolerance to homosexuality. In 1969, New York police officers raided the gay bar at the Stonewall Inn. The homosexuals retaliated with violent acts against the police officers, and the situation got completely out of hand after the officers lost control. After a few short weeks, activist groups in the village started to create places where homosexuals could fearlessly be open with their sexuality. A year later, the riots were commemorated with the first gay pride marches in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. They are still held annually each June to remember the Stonewall Riots and the impact it made upon homosexuality in America. Harvey Milk was an American politician who gained notoriety nationwide for becoming the first openly gay person to be elected into public office. In the years to come, he would be heralded as the most famous and most significant open LGBT official ever to be elected in the U.S. Harvey had known since high school that he was gay, but had never told anyone. Many that knew him never suspected that he was homosexual, given that he acted, quote-unquote, like a man's man. Milk joined the United States Navy during the Korean War and served aboard a submarine rescue ship as a diving officer and later transferred to San Diego to serve as a diving instructor until 1955. Somewhere in Des Moines or San Antonio, there's a young gay person who all of a sudden realizes that she or he is gay, knows that if the parents find out, they'll be tossed out of the house, the classmates would taunt the child, and the Anita Bryans and John Briggs are doing their bit on TV, and that child had several options, staying in a closet, suicide, and then one day that child might open up the paper and it says homosexual elected in San Francisco, and there are two new options. Option is to go to California. <laughs> Stay in San Antonio and fight. Two days after I was elected, I got a phone call, and the voice was quite young. It was from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And the person said, thanks. And you've got to elect gay people so that that young child and the thousands upon thousands like that child know that there's hope for a better world. There's hope for a better tomorrow. Without hope, not only gays, but those blacks, and the Asians, and the disabled, and the seniors, the us's, the us's without hope, yeses give up. I know that you cannot live on hope alone, but without it, life is not worth living. And you, and you, and you, you've got to give them hope. Thank you very much. Milk, however, was not without his share of opponents. Supervisor Dan White, a Vietnam veteran and former police officer and fireman, was troubled by what he perceived as a breakdown of traditional values and growing tolerance of homosexuality. During Milk's term, White resigned from his position, ostensibly because his salary could not support his family. His supporters convinced him to ask to be reappointed, but he was refused because his opponents, like Milk, 
wanted him to be, re be replaced by someone who was more liberal. On November 27, 1978, White entered City Hall with a loaded 38 caliber revolver. He avoided the metal detectors by entering through a basement window that had been left open for ventilation. His first stop was at the mayor of San Francisco's office, where he and the mayor began arguing, eventually moving to a private room so that they could not be heard. Once there, Mayor Moscone again refused to reappoint White, and White then shot the mayor twice in the chest and then twice in the head. White then went down the corridor and shot Milk, twice in the chest, once in the back, and twice again in the back of the head. Soon after, he turned himself in at the police station where he used to work. At the trial, White's defense team argued that his mental state at the time of the killing was not stable due to depression, and therefore was not capable of premeditating the killings and was not guilty of first-degree murder. The forensic psychiatrist on the case testified that White was suffering from depression and pointed to several behavioral symptoms, including the fact that White had gone from being highly health conscious to consuming sugary foods and drinks. This tactic became known as the Twinkie defense. The jury found White guilty of voluntary manslaughter instead of first degree murder and was sentenced to seven years in prison for the assassination of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone. Barbara Giddings was an activist for gay equality. She founded a gay rights group called the Daughters of Belitis and was part of the group who had homosexuality removed from the American Psychiatric Association's list of mental disorders. Frequently, she was found picketing at the White House or other large government agencies in attempts to gain rights and equality for homosexuals. Very involved in the American Library Association, Giddings created the first gay group in a professional organization by forming her own gay caucus of the ALA. She even had an award named after her. The ALA annually rewards the Barbara Giddings Award for the best gay or lesbian novel. Giddings based her success on reactions from the public. At an ALA convention in Dallas, she hosted a kissing and hugging booth under a sign that said, Hug a Homosexual, with a women-only side and a men-only side. With no public response, Giddings kissed another woman on live television, and that acquired some real attention for her case. After appearing on The Dave Susskind Show, a heterosexual couple approached her at the grocery store and told her, You made me realize that you gay people love each other just the way Arnold and I do. Encounters such as these are what mattered to Barbara Giddings in publicizing and gaining support for gay equality. Frank Khomeini was an important figure of the gay rights movement. He was fired from his position as an astronomer in the Army's Army Map Service in 1957 because of his homosexuality. He argued his case twice, attempting to appeal his job lost, and eventually fought it into the Supreme Court. Although he lost, it was the first civil rights case based on sexual orientation, and started a long line of cases to come. Later in 1961, Khomeini co-founded the Medicine Society along with Harry Hay. The group participated in protests for gay rights by picketing at the White House. Khomeini became the first openly gay candidate for U.S. Congress in 1971, when he ran as a delegate for the District of Columbia. He continued to fight for homosexual rights throughout his life until he passed away in 2011. Frank Khomeini and Barbara Giddings worked together to protest discriminatory employment policies by picketing Washington government agencies. The Mattachine Society was founded by Harry Hay along with Frank Khomeini and other men in Los Angeles. The society was formed with hopes to improve gay rights and tolerance, unify homosexuals, educate people about homosexual culture, help those who were being discriminated against, and get homosexuals to be more socially accepted. Closely linked to communism in society, the Mattachine Society membership levels fluctuated as the Red Scare progressed. Yet membership began to increase as they began working with the Daughters of Belitis, the first national lesbian organization founded by Barbara Giddings. The Daughters of Belitis created a magazine called The Ladder, the first published lesbian magazine in the United States. Its goal was to educate the public on homosexual prejudices and the lesbian struggle of assimilation. 
Homosexual acts were illegal and punishable until 1962, when Illinois became the first state to legalize homosexual contact between consenting adults. From then on, much progress has been made in proving the treatment and judgment of gay people and their behavior. In 1973, the APA removed homosexuality from its Manual of Mental Disorders. In 1975, Elaine Noble of Massachusetts became the first member of the House of Representatives to be openly gay or lesbian. In 1979, National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights in D.C. was hosted for about 75,000 people, which is the largest gathering of support for LGBT rights ever. In 1993, Clinton's policy of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was instituted in the military so that gays can serve and feel safe, but homosexual activities are not permitted in the military. Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage in 2004. California was second later that year. Many states, including New Jersey, Vermont, and Connecticut, legally recognized civil unions between same-sex couples in the past 15 years. In 2007, a bill was proposed and signed by the House of Representatives to achieve equal rights for homosexuals in the workplace. Much progress has been made in the movement in just the past few years, as people learn to become more tolerant of homosexuality. The progress of the gay rights movement consisted of events that would not have even been plausible to many people in the 1960s and 70s. With the help of many activists, equality groups, and protesters, and important figures of the movement in the 60s and 70s, the tolerance and overall equality for homosexuals has significantly improved over time. Gay clubs can be found in many high schools and colleges in America today, taking on names such as the Gay Straight Alliance or the Rainbow Connection. These clubs strive to bridge the gap that may exist and create a new generation of gay-friendly Americans. It's not unrealistic to predict that same-sex marriage will be legal nationwide in the near future, and one day it will seem just as commonplace as anything else in society. The gay icons of today include artists such as Lady Gaga, Macklemore, and Adam Lambert. In a world where homosexuality is practically glorified, those who fought for the rights of non-heterosexual Americans can safely say it succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. As more time passes, more seems to come out of the LGBT community to show that homosexuals and their allies have not only been working relentlessly for equal rights, but that they deserve them all along. Homosexuals in America today are now getting the recognition and rights they have earned over the course of 45 years of work. And that is fabulous. The brave still fears what we don't know. And God loves all his children. It's somehow forgotten. But we paraphrase a book written 3,500 years ago. I don't know. And I can't change. Even if I tried. Even if I wanted to.